Hello and welcome to this Bioprocess International Ask the Expert webcast. I'm your host, Leah Rosen, the online editor for Bioprocess International. Before we get started, just a couple of notes. This webcast is being recorded and will be made available for replay in the multimedia section of our website. We've muted the audio lines, but we welcome you to type in your questions for our speaker in the chat window on your screen. After the presentation, we will begin the question and answer portion and I will ask our speaker your questions from the chat window. Your questions in the chat window will only be visible to myself and our speaker. So thank you for joining us today. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Mark Snyder from BioRad Laboratories. Thanks, Leah, and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everyone. Um, I'm here today to talk about uh, CHT ceramic hydroxy appetite um, and also to introduce a new version of it, which we'll get to in time. So, um, this is the outline of the presentation. I'm going to talk about uh, just an introduction to CHT for those of you who may be unfamiliar with it, a little bit about how it works with method development. I'm going to spend just a minute on manufacturing because this has to do with how our latest version, CHT-XT, is made. I'm going to talk about it a bit, and then I'm going to show you some case studies with XT, followed by a selection guideline to help you pick which version of CHT to begin with. I'll talk just a minute about product formats and sampling if you're interested. So with that, so CHT is hydroxyapatite. It is a crystal mineral composed purely of calcium and phosphate. So the ligand and the matrix are the same. There are no pendant ligand groups on it. I put the formula here for those of you that are interested. It is a mixed mode resin. It has both calcium affinity and cation exchange. So those of you that are familiar with, for example, uh, various IMAC resins, such as our Nubia IMAC, it's like that except it's calcium instead of copper or nickel or cobalt or what have you. CHT is widely used in uh, bioprocessing for many, many licensed processes. Most popular applications are monoclonal antibodies, vaccine manufacturing, and separation or removal of aggregates and process impurities. However, if you do a quick search on the web, you'll find that it's been used to purify hundreds, if not thousands, of different proteins. And it's available in three types, type 1, type 2, and again, our newest, CHTXT. And I'll be getting to what these differences are between them in a minute or two. So uh, I wanted to put up this slide. CHT really is the universal polishing resin. I've shown on the left a list of most of the impurities that one would find in a process feed stream. And on the far right are the observed clearances that we typically see. I should say that uh, protein A, DNA, endotoxin, and retroviruses, generally these log clearances are always obtained no matter how you develop the process. And I may touch on that uh, in a little while. If I don't, somebody can ask me why that is. So let me talk a minute about exactly how CHT works at, at, the, at the atomic level, if you will. So this is a cartoon showing the surface of CHT with the calcium groups in orange, the phosphate groups in blue. And what you're seeing, first of all, is a protein which is positively charged or has positively charged groups on the surface, such as amino groups, interacts with CHT via classical cation exchange. And as such, you can dissociate it by adding neutral salts, such as sodium chloride, or buffering salts like phosphate, or you can increase the pH. Second mechanism is via calcium chelation. Again, this is metal affinity chromatography with calcium as opposed to some of the other metals with which you may be more familiar. This interaction is mediated by clusters of negatively charged carboxyl groups. We know it takes at least two from some mutation studies that were done about 20 or 25 years ago. It is a lot stronger than ionic interactions, meaning that you cannot dissociate this interaction by using high concentrations of salt. Dissociation requires phosphate when you're using CHT. Now, again, if you used IMAC before, you know that typically people will use imidazole as a desorbing agent. Here, you need to use phosphate. So these two mechanisms cover how proteins interact with CHT. I want to put up the other class of biomolecules uh, represented here by nucleic acids, which have a lot of negative charges on the surface, but this could also be, for example, endotoxin, um, which also is highly negatively charged. These species have so many negative charges on the surface that it takes um, a very high concentration of phosphate to dissociate them, so high that they really don't come off until you strip the column. 
which is why I said that clearances of these species are, are automatic. It's also true, interestingly enough, for protein A and antibody complexes. If you, if you analyze the behavior of protein A and antibody separately on CHT, both of those come off at a reasonable uh, concentration of, of during gradient dilution, but the complex of the two of them only comes off when you strip the column. So, uh, moving along, I'm going to show you a slide uh, that summarizes how one might go about doing process development or initial scouting with CHT. Typically, all, all experiments are conducted at a pH of 6.5 or greater. Um, this is usually the range in which people work. The higher the pH, the better it is for CHT. All buffers should have at least 5 millimolar phosphate in them. So this is the typical protocol that one uses for binding. Elution is carried out with phosphate uh, or sodium chloride, or in some cases, a combination of both. And regeneration uh, is stripping again with high phosphate to desorb any tightly bound species. If you need to go higher than 0.4 molar, you can use potassium salts and sanitization and hydroxide. So for basic proteins, again, which bind primarily via this cation exchange interaction, calcium affinity may play a minor role. Um, if it's not binding to CHT, consider using this as a flow-through step. Elution is carried out with either sodium chloride or phosphate because, again, both of those will cause desorption at these sites. So you can start out by trying uh, maybe zero to half molar sodium chloride uh, in a gradient in low concentrations of phosphate, again, at least five millimolar, but you may have to go a bit higher if there are, if there are any of these interactions that you need to eliminate. Basidic proteins, again, bind primarily via the calcium sites. Because this interaction is not affected by high salt, you may be able to do binding in high salt, and we do have some, uh, some of our customers who can bind in up to one molar sodium chloride, again, in low concentrations of phosphate. If your protein doesn't bind, again, consider a flow-through step. And elution this time is, is, is with phosphate. Again, you have to use phosphate to elute because this interaction is only, is only affected by phosphate. This will also be affected by phosphate, so both of these can be desorbed with phosphate. So again, you can start out trying a gradient. You can convert to a step if you want to. Some people include sodium chloride, some people don't. But this is the general overall process for working with proteins. We have a series of sample scouting protocols that we give in our instruction manual, which is available on our website, or you can ask one of your process specialists. So, how does CHT made? You mix together uh, uh, calcium hydroxide and phosphoric acid. It forms little tiny crystals. They're spray dried in a process very similar to making milk. Then these are sintered at a high temperature and sieved to get to the, pro the proper size. This is the CHT that a lot of people have used in the past. The introduction of CHT XT involves this step of jet milling where, the, where this crystal slurry is put into more or less a homogenizer which breaks down larger crystals into smaller crystals before the spray drying. These are some of the properties of the three. I'm not going to go through, through these in detail. You can look back on this presentation at your leisure. Um, but I give the binding capacity, pore size, surface area, and the packing density, which you need to know in order to figure out how much CHT you need to pack a column. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples of the use of CHT XT. First is an aggregate removal. So what you're looking at is an HPLC SEC of a monoclonal antibody coming off of protein A. And what you see is the aggregates represent about 28% of the total mass of the load of the CHT. This is a chromatogram. And what you see in a sodium chloride gradient is elution of the monomer here. So this is about 300, 250 millimolar sodium chloride. Aggregates come out in the strip. And when you take this peak and collect it and run it again on HPLC SEC, what you see is exactly one peak with little, with a very, very small amount of aggregate. So we reduced this from 28% down to 0.1, which is a, a 280-fold um, reduction, if I've done the math right. The purity of this in terms of monomer purity is greater than 99%, and we had about a 70% yield. 
I also want to talk for a minute about virus purification or VLP purification. Those of you that are working with viruses as gene therapy vectors know that typically viral purification requires ultracentrifugation or precipitation, which can have variable yield. This method is not easily scalable. It is scalable, but it's not easily scalable. And again, the recovery of activity can be variable. All three of these issues are solved by using CHT. And I'm going to show you that over the next couple of slides. So what, what I'm showing here is a chromatogram of, in this case, dengue virus purification. These are the conditions. It's basically a gradient in phosphate. And what you see on the chromatogram are, in green and blue, the 280 and 260 profiles, respectively. Purple shows the DNA, um, the, the DNA concentration, the aliots. In this case, the DNA was sheared to fairly small uh, fragments, which is why you're seeing it come out here as opposed to at the end of the gradient. And here's the virus coming off. Right, so the virus is well separated from, these, from all the rest of the species <coughs> in, the, uh, in the load. This material was then loaded onto an SDS page gel, and I'm going to show you that in the next slide. So what you see here on the left is a silver stain gel of the various fractions, and I'll just point right to fraction 6, which is the Eliot off of CHT. You see in the bottom of the two darker brands the E protein, below that is the NS1 protein. So these species are, are two of the proteins in dengue virus, um, and you can see it's very highly purified compared to the load material. And when you do a Western blot, um, what you see is the NS1 protein, the E protein, and now the core protein. So I want to spend just a minute and talk about the selection guideline that we've put together for using CHT. The first thing you want to consider is the size of the molecule to be purified. Again, the size is different between these three types of CHT, which will affect somewhat the binding capacity of your protein. So if you have a very large protein, such as IgM or adenovirus, you want to start with CHT type 2. That's our first suggested recommendation. For large to medium-sized species, up to, say, 400 kilodaltons, we suggest type 2 is your first choice, and if for whatever reason the properties aren't satisfactory, CHTXT is your second choice. For, for molecules that are smaller than 400 kilodaltons, look at the PI of the molecule. If it's acidic, CHT type 1 is your first choice because what we find is that type 1 binds typically acidic proteins to a higher capacity than the other types. If your protein is basic or neutral, we suggest XT is the first choice, and if for whatever reason the performance isn't satisfactory, we suggest CHT XT. This is only a guide to how you can start selecting which CHT type to use. Again, you can speak to your process specialist for more information. CHT is available in a number of formats. We have it in bulk formats from 10 grams for a sample bottle size up to 5 kilograms for process scale packing. It comes in a variety of pre-packed uh, formats as well for screening. We have a 1 mil column, 5 mil column, those are shown here and here, as well as 96 well formats. We have a 96 well plate, which is right here. It contains 20 microliters of oxygen. We come, it comes in 200 and 600 microliter robo columns. These are these eight column little sleeves here. They fit into a 96 well format. As far as our literature goes, we have a lot of it available on the web, and certainly all of it is, all of it is available through your process specialists. I've listed a couple of websites here where you can go to, both for the application guide that I talked about earlier, a variety of other application notes. If you want samples, all you have to do is click on this link, and a friendly buyer ad person will get back to you for, for whatever you want. We have a packing tutorial that's also available, I'd, um, which I can talk about later as well. And of course, we have a regulatory support file, which companies use in their filings with the various regulatory. So if you have any questions outside of this uh, presentation, again, here are where the, the various online resources are. And I put down two email uh, addresses. You can contact BioRed Technical Support in general at support.biored.com or you can contact your process specialist for specific assistance with process residents at process at biorad.com. And with that, I will open the floor to questions.
Okay. Thanks, Mark. So the first question is, which one is the max pressure? What is the max pressure? So what we find is that generally people work in a pressure range of three to five bar. Typically for larger columns, three bar, if it's acrylic or glass, tends to be the maximum. Stainless can go up higher than that, but CHT is well able to handle those pressures with no issue. Okay. And I've heard that CHT is hard to pack. Are there any suggestions? So I'm glad somebody asked this question. Uh, a year and a half ago, I packed a 1.8 meter column with CHT. It took about a half an hour. CHT by far is the easiest resin to pack of any resins, compressible or not, that are out there. CHT is not a compressible resin. So there's some things you need to know before you try to pack it. Uh, it's a lot like packing silica or controlled pour glass from that perspective. So please contact a BioRed process specialist or us here at BioRed in Hercules, California, if you have any questions about how to pack. Once you know how to do it, it's trivial. So will a disposable column formats be available and when? Um, yes, they'll be available at the, in the last quarter of this year. Okay. And what is the particle size of CHTXT? So CHTXT is a 40 micron particle. Types 1 and type 2 are available at 40 to 80 micron. Okay. Does the temperature of load affect the binding? So that's a great question. Um, there haven't been any detailed studies on this. Um, from what I know about the thermodynamics, I would not expect that. This is in contrast to HIC resins, for example, where temperature plays a big effect. But I, I don't think that it has much of an effect with CHT because, again, the binding, the binding mechanisms are well known and have been well studied, and there really aren't a lot of temperature effects with either ion exchange or with metal affinity. How about the cleaning of the column? So the column is typically cleaned with high phosphate, 0.4 molar or above. Do not include sodium chloride because that will actually make the cleaning worse. Um, if you have questions about that, you can email us. But you, you clean it in 0.4 or, or higher concentrations of phosphate, and then you can sanitize in one normal hydroxide and store in 0.1. And that's true for all types. How comparable is CIP to type 1 and 2? Right, so again, oh, so, so all three types of CHT use exactly the same cleaning regimen. Okay. Again, you'll want, to, you'll, you'll want to validate your own cleaning for developing your process. And does flow rate affect binding? That's a great question. The answer is, in a sense, both yes and no. Flow rate certainly affects binding because these processes are diffusion controlled. But within the typical range of, let's say, 150 to maybe 250 centimeters an hour, there's probably not a huge effect. But certainly, if you want the maximum binding capacity for any resin, CHT or otherwise, you'll want to use a, a slow flow rate as is practical for your process. OK. And this is the last question uh, due to time. So if you have more questions, go ahead and type them in there, and we'll pass them on to Mark, and he'll be able to get back to you. So the last question now is, due to more specific binding of CHT, is it suitable as a primary capture step? So that's a great question. And the answer really is it depends. It, it's going to take me a while to explain that. Um, so if you want to know about that, um, please email our, our uh, process specialist. And, and they'll get in touch with me, or the, and, and either they or I will be happy to answer that question. The, the, the short answer is it depends upon what is in the feed stream, what's in the growth medium to some extent. OK. So thank you, Mark. Sure. And thanks to our audience for joining us. The recorded version of this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing on our website. And as a registered attendee, you'll receive a follow-up email providing you with a direct link. So we yes, look forward to having you join us. Getting at our... up early or staying up late. <laughs> yeah. We look forward to having you join us at our future Bioprocess International Ask the Expert webcasts. Look for those announcements in your inbox. Thanks.